In 2010, the seventh Saw movie was released and dubbed as The Final Chapter. In that same year, the creators of the original Saw, Lee Winnell and James Wan, created a new franchise called Insidious. On the chalkboard in the background of Insidious is a sketch of a familiar face, Billy the Puppet from the Saw movies, accompanied by the number 8. This was the first ever clue about the 8th Saw movie, which would be released 7 years later and be titled Jigsaw. Jigsaw also contains many easter eggs of its own, so stick around if you want to hear about them. Welcome to Things You Missed. I know this is my third attempt at a Things You Missed episode on Jigsaw, but the first two videos were made while the movie was still in theaters, so having the ability to pause and write down my notes has given me time to notice many more Things You Missed, from the secrets hidden on the computer screens to some of the oldest franchise staples being reimagined for a new decade. Let's go ahead and get into them. It opens with the Lionsgate logo, but unlike many Saw films, this one uses the regular Lionsgate animation as opposed to the spooky one. I mean, what's going on here? Did they just forget? The first actual shot of the movie is this rolled up mat of tire spikes used to slow down a fleeing car, but the starburst shaped image of the spikes also foreshadows the final scene of the movie, where we get a nice blooming bouquet of Halloran head. The man trying to escape the police is Edgar Munson, who has been pressured into finding the trigger that starts the 2016 edition of The Barn Game. As he runs, we hear a cinematic cover of the main theme of the franchise, Hello Zep, with the melody being converted into percussion. He gets to the rooftop and finds the trigger hidden behind a red X. This is a callback to the idea of X marks the spot, which was a clue given by Jigsaw to the players of his games in Saw and Saw 2. X marks the spot. What? X marks, marks the spot for the answer. But it would be Saw 2's X that most closely relates to the X seen in Jigsaw. In Saw 2, I discussed how the painting that contains the X was actually a clue about the movie's twist. How the game at the nerve gas house and the police raid of Wilson Steel Plant could not have taken place at the same time, because this painting exists in both locations. We eventually find out that the nerve gas house stuff seen on the screens was just playback of events that had already happened many hours before. Jigsaw uses the same twist, only the game at the barn takes place many years before the stuff in the present. It's unlikely Jigsaw would use two X markers in the same game, so when we see a second X on the tractor later in the movie, that's a clue that this game isn't the same game as the one in the present. That may be the most cryptic clue, but it certainly isn't the only one. The movie is actually brimming with evidence that the barn game we see is John Kramer's earliest test game, taking place over a decade before Halloran begins to investigate the victim referred to as Buckethead. When Jigsaw's voice comes on for the first time, we don't see their facial reactions, but we can tell that they're scared, as anyone would be if they were kidnapped. In fact, they never refer to Jigsaw being their possible captor, because Jigsaw isn't even a known figure at this point. This is before the bathroom game or the razor wire trap. A voice that said salvation can be ours if we cleanse our soul of our lies. They aren't even familiar with the concept of games yet, because the only trap so far was Cecil, which was never made public. He said it was a game. Well, then I hope for all of our sakes that it is a game. Well, yeah, why is that, sweetheart? This game's gonna be won. Everyone acts scared when they see Billy, not because they recognize him from Jigsaw's tapes, but just because he's creepy on his own. No, that's not creepy at all. When Logan and Eleanor examine the first victim, there's another clue about the massive time gap. The partial decapitation is made by a circular saw. The traces of ferric oxide, hematite in the wound. Rust from blades. When we saw the blades in the first room, they looked brand new, but after sitting there for over a decade, it makes sense that they might have accumulated some rust. There seems to be a moment in the final room where Anna recognizes John Kramer, but she recognizes him as her next door neighbor, not as the jigsaw killer. Hello, Anna. John. John Kramer. Then there's the issue of the victims themselves. The first victim, Buckethead as they call him, was Malcolm Neal, who was a criminal that Halloran tried to convict, so Nelson made him a part of his imitation version of John Kramer's barn game. Each player of the imitation game in 2016 bears a resemblance to someone from the original game in 2003. We never see Malcolm Neal's face, but we do see the faces of Carly from 2003 and her counterpart in 2016, and they're clearly not the same person. I'm not allowed to show a dead body, but I can show you the credits, where Carly and Carly lookalike are played by different 
different actresses. For some reason, Mitch's lookalike is not in the credits, but if you go on IMDb, you can compare the two actors. They don't actually look that much alike, but since we only see Carly and Mitch's present day counterparts covered in blood, it's a little harder to tell. But you definitely will notice it if you're looking for it. It gets a bit convoluted when we find out that Malcolm Neal's counterpart from the past is actually Nelson himself, who was put into the original Barn game for messing up John Kramer's x-rays, but was bailed out because he didn't wake up in time, resulting in some deep lacerations on his back, which we see the scars of in the present day storyline. And that's kind of confusing because he also put himself in the recreated game, but his counterpart is Malcolm Neal, not himself. Jigsaw put five people in his game. I put in three. You and I are the last two. So Carly's counterpart is Carly lookalike, Mitch's counterpart is Mitch lookalike, Logan Nelson's counterpart is Malcolm Neal, Ryan's counterpart is Logan Nelson, and Anda's counterpart is, I guess, Halloran. By itself, that might not be enough to figure it out, but the existence of a secret game that precedes the Saw saga is dangled in front of us by Eleanor. Supposedly, John Kramer designed this trap for a game that took place before all the others. They found the plans in his lab, I built it myself. Of course, we see that same trap in the barn game. When Eleanor and Logan go into the barn in the present, you can spot one of the bucket masks near the door, and it looks like it's been there rusting for years. So all of that adds up to make Jigsaw's twist ending kind of an homage to the this game already happened twist seen in Saw 2. Although I do think it's more satisfying in Saw 2 because we find out the same way that the characters find out, whereas Jigsaw is told out of order just to trick the audience, but I've come to appreciate it as just being there to honor the history of the franchise. There would be many other secrets that pay homage to other aspects of the Saw movies hidden inside of Jigsaw. A couple of the supporting characters in Jigsaw seem to be spiritual successors to characters from the original series. Detective Keith Hunt originally appears to be the new version of SWAT officer Daniel Rigg, but we later find out he's with internal affairs, just like Matt Gibson from Saw 7. There's also an unnamed doctor in Jigsaw, who looks like she could be the sister of Lynn Denlin from Saw 3. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Not sure if this is intentional, I don't know how many people do this, but the doctor is also wearing her watch on the inside of her wrist, just like John Kramer does. The game itself also shares a ton of similarities to other traps and games that we've seen in the Saw series. And I think that because the barn game was essentially a test for Jigsaw before taking his games public, he could reuse many of these concepts in his later work. Let's look at the first room. There are many similarities to Saw 5, the most obvious being that we have five players with chains around their necks that are pulling them towards these dangerous blades. 60 seconds are given in both scenarios. Today, five will become one with a common goal of survival. However, if one of you moves to retrieve a key, the 60 second timer will begin for you all. Maybe this is a foreshadowing of the fact that the barn game requires players to work together, which is also what the Fatal Five was tasked with figuring out. It was meant for five people. The final room of their trial asks for a blood sacrifice, just like the blade room in Jigsaw. The device before you is one of sacrifice, a sacrifice of blood. First, an offering of blood, no matter how little will give you a green light. The Blood Sacrifice is one of many examples of Jigsaw intentionally making his teachings have these religious undertones. I've pointed out examples throughout the Saw Things You Missed episodes, but in Jigsaw, it's on display more than ever. Listen to the way John Kramer addresses his followers. Salvation can be yours if you cleanse yourselves of the habitual lies which have brought you here. Confess the truth will set you free. He also speaks not of rehabilitating his victims like he does during the Saw Saga, but he mentions the need for them to release their demons. If you can release yourself from your demons, you can begin to shed the chains that those demons bring with them. Previous Saw movies tied into religion because John's traps represented the idea of suffering as a form of repentance for one's sins, while Jigsaw focuses more on confession, which is also what Logan's ultimate final plan is for Halloran. Innocent people died because of me, I did it! The most important part of his revenge is that he recorded this confession, and perhaps that is part of the reason that this movie's iteration of Billy the Puppet has unique glowing red eyes. A red light is the universal sign for recording. I've also theorized that it could be a foreshadowing of what happens to Carly after she's injected with the acid, because it causes blood to seep from her eyes, giving her the appearance of having red eyes. This happens after Jigsaw challenges her to choose the needle that represents how much she values a human life, with each one labeled to a specific dollar amount. The needle with the correct answer contains 
finds an antidote. This is a reference back to the Nerve Gas House game, where players must compete to win antidotes for a poison coursing through each of their systems. There's also a reference to the original Saw. After hearing Jigsaw explain the rules, the test subjects check themselves to see if they've been injected with anything. Okay, check yourself for marks. Huh? If he injected us, there could be marks. This is the same reaction Adam has shortly after waking up in the bathroom. Do you see any scars? What? Huh? This is what they do, man. They kidnap you and drug you. Before you know it, you're lying in a bathtub and your kidneys are on eBay. As I mentioned, Carly's lookalike shares a similar fate in the present. She's found to have been injected with hydrofluoric acid, the same substance that Jigsaw would go on to use in Saw 6 when hydrofluoric acid is injected into William Easton during the zoo game. Hey, Chef. What does that stand for? Hydrofluoric acid? This stuff will lead to human flesh within seconds. The next trap of Kramer's Barn Game was also designed to drown us in Saw Easter eggs. It starts when Mitch and Anna go into a grain silo. They're buried alive in corn kernels, while Ryan is stuck on the outside with the ability to save them at his own personal expense. This is the exact setup that Jigsaw would one day use for the pig vat trap from Saw 3. In the pig vat, Jeff Denlin must decide whether or not to save the judge that sentenced his son's killer from being drowned in pig guts at the cost of burning the child's old possessions. So there's another reference to the pig vat in Jigsaw. Remember that music I was jamming out to in my Saw 3 episode? For whatever reason, it's not in the original motion picture soundtrack for Saw 3. It may be because the riff is very similar to Eyes of the Insane by Slayer. So maybe they got a little bit nervous about copyright and decided not to put that part in the score. But the good news is there's a more finished version in Jigsaw. It plays during the cycle trap, where it's mostly drowned out by sound effects and dialogue, but luckily it's also in the end credits and it did make it into the soundtrack this time. I personally love it when music has engine sounds as part of the mix for some reason. NASCAR type theatrical hybrid event is probably my favorite death clock song, and Horsepower is the song that got me into Muzzy. Personally, I'm still holding out for the composer, Charlie Clauser, to play Knotfest. But the grain silo trap has more than just one Easter egg to offer, because after the thing fills up with kernels, sharp objects begin to rain down on the characters. The abandoned bar is owned by Jill Tuck's family. That's Jigsaw's ex-wife, if you don't remember. I've always wondered where John gets all of the weapons used to create his traps, and obviously they come from many sources. It seems like many of them could have been tools at the pig farm. Among the items that fall are circular saw blades, which are obviously a part of many traps, but most notably the ending of Jeff's trial. <laughs> Knives, like those seen in Saw 4's knife chair trap. <laughs> Stakes, which play a vital part in the spike trap from Saw 6. Meat hooks, which are used to hoist Bobby Dagan in Saw 7. I'm gonna make this right. And these mugs from the CZ's World merch store. Wait, what, what is that doing in there? Next trap. Actually, before we even get to the next room, the dividers between these two rooms are the exact ones from the Gideon meatpacking plant in Saw 3 and 4. Just thought I'd point that out. But moving on, the next room is the human blender, and this iteration of it is powered by a motorcycle. This is Mitch's test, because he sold John's nephew a motorcycle one time and the brakes didn't work and the kid died. So his goal in this trap is to reach for the brake that will slow down this motorcycle. But that would not be the last trap that John Kramer creates where the subject has to reach into danger to access the brake for an automobile. This pays tribute to the horsepower trap, the setup that proves fatal for Evan and his friends in Saw 7. After Mitch stars in the world's scariest episode of Will It Blend, only Anna and, uh, and part of Ryan remain. They are subdued by John Kramer in a pig mask, and they next wake up in the slaughter room. I think this reference will be fairly obvious to Saw fans, but they each end up facing each other, each with an ankle and a shackle on opposite sides of the room. This scenario obviously calls back to Dr. Gordon and Adam's situation in the bathroom game. I just woke up here, just like you. But the trap scene in John Kramer's original Barn game weren't only nostalgic references to traps and set pieces of the Saw saga that ran from 2004 to 2010. From Eleanor's studio to Nelson's apartment, there are still plenty more things you missed for us to explore. We can't let Jigsaw have all the fun in this episode, because this movie represents the passing of the torch to a new disciple, Logan Nelson. Early on, we see part of the reason that Nelson wants to test Detective Halloran. Why do you think he asked for you? We're good friends. 
put him away twice. Halloran was a corrupt cop, and at the end of the film, Nelson gets him to admit all of his wrongdoing by making him think that Jigsaw is back and threatening him with the laser collar. We actually see this payoff set up by Eleanor as they examine the first victim. She uses a singular laser cutter to remove the bucket fastened to his head. This does kind of raise some questions for me, like, if this thing cuts through steel, why doesn't it just cut all the way through the building? But we're not here to focus on that, we're here to talk about the flash drive that Logan pulls out of the victim, because it's a reference to an earlier Saw movie. You may remember when we talked about Saw 4, where the recently passed away Jigsaw has one final message for Detective Hoffman, a tape that he covers in wax and swallows for the pathologist to discover. Where is it? He's in his stomach. When Logan discovers the flash drive, he has to cut it out of the plastic wrapping that it's encased in before putting it into a computer to listen to the audio. The games have begun again, and they will not stop until the sins against the innocent are atoned for. When they get the results of the voice analysis back, Logan echoes one of Jigsaw's mottos, we speak for the dead. Just because someone is dead doesn't mean they can't have a voice. Give us enough time, we speak for the dead. It reminds me of the time Hoffman, who was secretly Jigsaw's successor at the time, used John's motto as part of his speech at a police press conference. Throughout this ordeal, if we've learned anything, it's that human life is sacred. And we've learned that every day, Life should be cherished. And speaking of Hoffman, I've got a little something for all of you Hoffman is Alive people. There's the scene where we see Hunt walking through the police station, and in the background, there's a board of wanted posters. If Hoffman was alive, don't you think that Hoffman would be on here? The only possibility, really, is that he's alive, but he's in jail. Last time we saw him, he was left in the bathroom to die. Now, we know that the bathroom was eventually discovered because in Eleanor's studio, there's a replica of the hacksaws, which were only ever used at the bathroom. She also has a replica of the magnum eye hole trap, which is in the room with the stairs that lead down to the tunnel network where the bathroom is. Though it is possible that her recreation of the magnum eye hole was based entirely off of blueprints, but as far as the hacksaw goes, I can't really imagine that there would be blueprints for that. Plus, even if there were for some reason, she wouldn't know that they were significant unless the bathroom was discovered. My point is, they probably did discover it, but Hoffman was probably dead by the time they got there. Other than the magnum eye hole, there are replicas of many other iconic saw traps seen in Eleanor's studio. There's the angel trap, which Detective Carey was caught in during Saw 3. The water cube that Special Agent Strom escaped in Saw 5. The reverse bear trap. This is the model used against Amanda Young in Saw and Jill Tuck in Saw 7. This might be the razor box from Saw 2. It's hard to tell for sure, but I feel like we will see this location again in a future film. The closet is a hidden door, which is one of the recurring staples of the franchise, and in the closet there's a copy of the knife on a chain from the Pound of Flesh trap in Saw 6. The inside of the closet is a shrine to Jigsaw, and contains the actual newspaper headlines seen throughout the seven past movies. She also has an evidence marker, just like those used at the Jigsaw crime scenes, and what appears to be the black hair from either Billy the Puppet or the Pig Masks. At one point, we actually get a better look at one of the newspapers that appeared in Saw 4, but in that movie, it was too blurry to actually make out any of the text. It gives us a few more Saw 4 Easter eggs, but I think it makes sense that I include them in this video, since they're only readable in Jigsaw. They are, as usual, the writers of these articles being being named after the film crew of the fourth movie. Ryan Huppinen was the art production coordinator, Ashley Millar worked craft services in a rare on-screen appearance for the snack department, and Pauline Kwong was a payroll accountant. And no, that is not a racial stereotype joke. Look it up. If you watched all of the previous videos in the Saw Things You Missed series, you now know about a ton of those crew member references across the series. Jigsaw does things a bit differently, though. There's only one such reference that I noticed, and it might just be a total coincidence and I'm looking too much into it, but in the cemetery scene, there's a headstone labeled Armstrong. The biggest difference between Jigsaw and the Saw movies is the cinematography. David Armstrong was the cinematographer of Saws 1 through 6, and his style was emulated in Saw 7. So to me, this tombstone represents the death of the Armstrong look. Or maybe they just filmed in an actual cemetery and this just happened to be there. If anybody lives in Toronto, let me know. I mean, I know people live in Toronto, obviously. You know what I meant. As far as references to other stuff outside the franchise, there's not much. Unless you want to call this a reference to Wolverine or Freddy Krueger. I'm not sure that I want to. But there does seem to be one reference to an outside work, but I can't take credit for finding it. So I'm not going to. Roll the clip. Apparently, critics have noted a structural similarity between the Saw films and French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's famous play, No Exit. So I watched all seven movies, read No Exit, and immediately called bullshit. The connection was too tenuous. Then Jigsaw came out, and when I saw this, I was like, huh. 
I'll leave the link in the description if you want to see his whole video. But the basic gist of it is that this play, No Exit, is all about the torture of confessing and being judged for one's sins by others. That's the reason that Jigsaw in this movie tortures his victims by asking them to confess in front of the group, as opposed to a physical torture seen in the previous entries. Maybe that's the reason that Jigsaw's credits bring back the music from the pig vat trap, because that's like the one other trap in the series that focuses much more on psychological torture. So Jigsaw redefines what it means to experience torture, and it would also redefine one of the long-running symbols of the franchise, the pigs. In a previous video, I mentioned that one of the main characters in the movie, Detective Halloran, doesn't have a name other than... Halloran. Well, I'm proud to announce that I, CZ's World, have discovered Halloran's first name. It's Brad. He's a Brad. They say that finding this name is as rare as finding Obama's last name, so make sure you like this video just for that alone. <laughs> when Eleanor is putting together the pathology report on the first victim, she discovers traces of pig fecal matter found to contain Ojeski's disease. When swine get it, farmers have to wipe out the entire sander. In all of the other Saw movies, pigs represent the rebirth of John's followers. They're metaphorically leaving their crimes, or at least what Jigsaw perceives as crimes, in a previous life. It seems like in Jigsaw, though, the meaning of the pig symbol has been expanded to where pigs are are now also a sign of compassion. Did you know that pigs are highly compassionate animals? They show distress if they see any other animal, including humans, suffering. John's goal has always been to make his subjects endure suffering, open their eyes, and make them appreciate their lives again. If they survive, they become his followers and wear the pig mask to help spread John's message to others. That's why it's significant that the barn game takes place in a pig farm. Each of them represents one of his pigs. They can either win and become his followers or lose and be slaughtered. The final room, which was to be their final test, is the slaughter room. But throughout the game, he doesn't actually have followers yet, so he's seen wearing the pig mask himself during the past storyline. In the present storyline, it appears that John Kramer, or one of his disciples, is back again and holding new games. And at the end of the movie, Logan and Eleanor go to hunt him down. During these scenes, Eleanor is wearing a leopard print jacket, and leopards are a natural predator of many wetland hogs and boar. In other words, leopards hunt pigs. And although that was Eleanor's intention, she ends up having to run from the pig farm, where she's picked up by a driver. We never see who it is, but she looks kind of distressed and confused when she sees the person. Could it be Dr. Gordon? Daniel? Corbett? Only time will tell. Literally! Cause I'm building a time machine to find out! Oh my god, that's a terrible idea! So we eventually come to learn that Logan Nelson was actually Jigsaw's apprentice all along. And he was putting himself in the game at the end there, just as John did, just as Amanda did, and just as Hoffman did. But how did he make this whole thing work? Let's take a look back at it. There was a lot of background work required by Nelson, such as sneaking back into St. Peter's Hospital to kidnap Edgar Munson, digging up John Kramer's grave, and depositing the bodies of the recreated game throughout the city for Brad Hall around to find. I guess we are to believe that he just stays up and does all this stuff overnight based on what he tells his daughter's babysitter. I'm sorry you have to stay so late again, Judy. There's also a clue about him being connected to Jigsaw in his study, where you can spot one of those little Buddhist figures in his bedroom, just like the ones first seen at John Kramer's deathbed, among other appearances throughout the series. When Brad looks into Logan Nelson's bio on the Veterans Affair database, there's a lot of background information about his time during and after serving in the army. There's a lot to cover here that helps explain why he never helped Jigsaw during the Saw Saga. If you're interested, I made a whole video on the history of Logan Nelson. When Eleanor shows him the studio, they're tailed by Hunt, who I can already tell is a better evidence photographer than Adam because he doesn't blatantly use flash in a dark room. But Logan was still later able to convince Hunt that Brad Halloran was setting him up. By the time Hunt gives his people the order to arrest Brad, he's already tailing Logan and Eleanor. They end up essentially leading him into his own tomb. I noticed that the situation is very similar to what Hoffman does to Peter Strom in Saw 5. Actually, it's not very similar. It's exactly the same. He makes J. Jonah Erickson suspicious of Strom, he knows Strom is following him, and he leads him right into his final trap. Brad finds himself in the slaughter room, where he and Logan both appear to be imprisoned by these collars, and Logan uses an old saw trick to get him to make his confession. The lasers on Logan's collar are fake, and so is the blood that spurts out when the lasers zero in on him. We've seen Adam do it, we've seen Jigsaw do it, we've seen Daniel Matthews do it, we've seen Eric Matthews do it, and now we would see Logan Nelson play dead to get the upper hand on his opponent. As I mentioned way back at the beginning, after a confession, we see the Brad flower bloom into eight petals, as we would come to the end of the eighth movie. I have got to get a slidey door like that, so I can game over all of my guests. I speak for the dead. Or that. 
All right, we've done them all. Click the playlist on the left to see things you missed in every single Saw film. And we're only a week away from a new Saw movie being released. If you want to see everything that you might have missed in Spiral, then remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.